Hey, it's Karen Kalla. And we're back with another episode of The Boozy Bitties. This is the drink as you learn school with two longtime friends. And sometimes two boozy bitties. How about another hard hitter from Italy today? Veneto. Veneto? What do we say? Veneto. Be- Veneto. <laughs> Stay tuned to find out how I screwed up and bought most likely the wrong bottle, but it's a Trebbiano to Lugana. It's always something. Um, I'm drinking a Prosecco, which is 100% from Veneto because it can also be from other regions. Um, but yeah, Italian bubbles. Grab a glass of something Italian. You don't have to be too specific and join us. Yes, so we have just already recorded a mini-sode today, too. So this is, you know, episode one after episode 0.5. And so this could go either way for us, to be honest with you. But I'm going to enjoy the start of my my fun employment, as they call it, and uh, go to Glacier for a week. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. Yeah, That's why we're recording the back-to-back. At least it's not like we used to have, like, hour-long episodes and we tried to do those back to back no (laughs) that was it's like just like all wine we we change as well we we go with the times and see what works best for us and improve hopefully or try to improve right um but yeah so veneto like i was i knew it's one of like the biggest wine producing regions in italy but i actually didn't realize like historically speaking too there's a lot i don't know why because it's up there with um, Piedmont, which we just talked about, but like mm-hmm. it has a lot longer wine history, or at least evidence of wine. So. Yeah, it's among the you know foremost wine producing regions in Italy in both terms of quantity and quality. It's got the largest quantity of DOC and DOCG wines out of any Italian winemaking region, um, and one of the ones that we'll talk about, one of the most famous big reds from um, Italy. Italy, the Amarone. <laughs> I know. I'm right. <laughs> what what country are we talking about again? <laughs> no worries. Well, you do have Austria. Well, bordered by Austria. That's right. But it's bordered by Austria. Austria. Yes, it's bordered by Austria. So I think there could be some influence in some of those areas. Um, they do use some of the international varietals that we see in Austria too. So maybe, 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 maybe. I don't yeah. know. And for those of you who like need to put this on a map in your brain, this is where Venice is. So yes, Venice is in Veneto. Yes, the 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 sinking city of italy yeah yeah i don't think it's going well it's going to be i don't think it's soon. yeah Climate so, so, is, so is new york for that matter so <laughs> <laughs> i think new york is the new venice from what i've been seeing let's Probably. just turn all the subways into <laughs> to canal systems oh it's amazing i was just at the u.s open over the weekend um so like a few days after whichever storm came through that was ida and, or is that another storm yeah ida passed? it was ida yeah. Yeah, but I'm like driving and there's like all these cars just still parked on the side of the highway um, when, when I'm like leaving, you know, Long Island City going to Flushing where the stadiums are because they all got flooded and they just left them there because they just put into insurance. But they're like, I mean, I guess they're not nice now, but people just like left their beamers and their whatever on the side of the road. Um, Jesus. Yeah, so. I don't know. So, you know, climate change is a real bitch. There's our PSA for the day. It exists, guys. So, it exists. Uh, Re- recycle your bottles. <laughs> recycle your bottles. Uh, take your reusable bags. I mean, drive a Prius, but don't because they suck. I drive one. It's terrible. Sorry, Prius. You're good mm-hmm. for gas mileage, but you're not fun for anything else. <laughs> not for anything else. All right. Well, back to Veneto. Now that we had our PSA moment, um, do you want me to start off with the history? Because we have a little bit Yeah, little bit why of not? It. Yeah, because, yeah, we're going to talk, there's a few grapes and, like, wines in the history that, like, I don't think they make them so much anymore, but just so everyone knows, um, they actually have, like, evidence, like, the the seeds, I guess the pips from grapes um, from, like, forever, forever back, like, pre-7th century BCE, but they think that they were mostly maybe used, like, people just ate them, like, they came across, like, wild berries and wild grapes, and they ate them. Um, but 7th century BCE, we have the first evidence of wine production, and it's attributed to the Etruscans, um, which were like a tribal people um, that lived in northern Italy down through Tuscany, um, you know, before Common Era, before the Roman Empire. Um, and they were in this region called Raetia, I guess is how you would call it. Is there That's all how that? I would guess it. Yeah, they're not even Italian words anymore. They're like pre-Latin languages. Um, but wine from that region produced by the Etruscans um, – was produced for a long time, so it actually got a name for itself. Um, some of our, our favorite people, like Pliny the Elder. We love um, him. Yeah, so he, he liked this wine. I think he liked a lot of wines, and then he just liked to like trash talk like a few of them. But for the most part, it seems like he was a big fan of, of most of the wines. Um, but yeah, Pliny the Elder liked it, and then some other 
ancient Roman dudes, Calamula, Celsa, Aulo Cornelius, Marshall, which is M A R T I L, not Marshall. I wish it was, yeah, it was just like M A R S H A L L, Marshall. <laughs> yep. Suetonius, who I've, I've seen that name before, so he was important. Don't know what he did. Um, and then Virgil, the poet, um, he believed this the wine from this region was second only to the famous Falerno wine. Which you skipped over know. Strabone there. Like, what's up with Strabone? You just don't like him? I was just trying to, like, I don't know, shorten this a little know. bit. All the names. Yeah, yeah. By one there's, name. There's also, there's also a dude named name. Strabone. Yes. <laughs> yes. You're like, I'll shorten this by only taking out one name. <laughs> yes. Well, I, you got <laughs> deep into it. Then I was like, gosh. And I gotta <laughs> this is exhausting already. <laughs> finish it um but yeah so that was retic wine produced with the retic grape which i don't even know if that's still around um so then we ha- also have ostinatico which it was a sweet wine that was famous towards the end of the roman empire um and so there was a few different things they were making and it was popular and i think it was kind of exported at least throughout the boot um and in 643 a.d the vineyards of veneto were actually the first time protected by law so we have a similar thing um, not so much like in Piedmont when they were like Nebbiolo, if you pick Nebbiolo or cut off your hand, but they did protect <laughs> vineyards. Um, there's a, I don't know what people this is, the Longobard King, Rotari. So there's also a group I'm gonna of people cut called you the Longobards. For a second, I just looked sure. up Radic wine to see if it's still made. Mm-hmm. And Radic just translates to rustic. So we don't know what the grape is. The internet told me that Radic was a grape too. So it probably is called the rustic grape and it's rustic wine, but I don't really see if it's really made anymore. Yeah. So can't okay, have that. Can we, can we have Asinatico? I'll double check on that while you tell me more about Longobard. Yeah, so Long. well, his name was Rotari, but he was a Longobard. <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> so, sorry. So, <laughs> I like, I like R- Longobard R- better. <laughs> so Rotari, the Longobard king. Um, but yeah, so he set up an edict which had penalties for anyone who damaged vineyards or stole grapes. So it's very serious stuff. But yes, you can still get that Asinatico wine. Asinatico okay. wine? Asinatico wine. Some people are still Asinatico. making it in the Ricciotto Classico method. They've, you know, mm. mostly in the Valpolicella DOC. So okay. there you go. There you go. So you can still try that one, mm-hmm. um, which was favored. There were also a bunch of names associated with people, Romans who liked that, but I didn't write those ones down. So okay. I'll have to figure that out. We know how um, you're feeling about names today. So yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we have protection of official protection of wine. I wonder today, like if you're out in like Napa Valley and you just like steal a bunch of grapes and put them in your purse, what happens? Um, they cut your penis off. I believe they, <laughs> they, they went one further than the Italians. <laughs> we'll go test some national laws we'll just go around the world stealing grapes, grapes and see what and see, happens see what happens we're just gonna come back with a bunch of prosthetics there you go it's another another boozy bitty. her legs were cut con- off con- her arms endeavor. were cut off her ears were cut off her eyes were gouged out <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a TikTok sound, so that's the only reason I know that. Oh boy, this is going dark. <laughs> All right, well anyway, so we're not going to steal any grapes yet, we'll give that a pause. Um, but yeah, so like modern wine history in the Veneto region, the Middle Ages, we have the rise of Venice as a merchant city, um, and apparently this kind of both helped and hurt the actual wine production in the region because... Obviously, they had access to Venice. They could export their wines sort of throughout the Mediterranean. But that said, it seems like the like Venetians were actually big fans of Greek wine. So they would export out some of the wine from Veneto region, but then they would also import a lot of Greek wine, which would sort of compete for favor. Um, and then as um, Venice sort of declined as being quite so much of a like a world merchant stop outpost, um, as that influence declined, there was less importing of Greek wines. This is sort of like post, um, like 1500s, early 1600s. That's when sort of Veneto's wine regions really started to flourish because they were then producing wine almost exclusively for that region. There was less um, Greek wine coming in. That said, this is when a lot of Greek grapes like Malvasia um, were brought into Veneto. So there is still the influence in probably both the production and some of the varietals. Um, and then we have some of the standard challenges of Italy and also sometimes of Europe. Um, there's big lack of centralization. So it was sort of like some successful pockets here and there, but there was really no like main chain of command. Um, 
apparently there are a lot of cold spells in the early 1700s. And then, of course, in the 1800s, we have phylloxera. Our buddy phylloxera. Phylloxera popped up. Um, and then I guess it was slow rebuilding. Um, 1900s, we have the introduction of even more international varietals and also sort of end of 1800s and early 1900s. Um, two big like oenology schools, institutes um, were created. One is called the School of Enology of Con- Conelliano. Um, and the other is the Experimental Station of Viticulture and Enology. The Experimental Station. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess they've been helping sort of centralize some of the, the standards and, you know, produce more quality wines. So that's been a thing ongoing through the 1900s. So that is the history. Huh. All right. I like <laughs> the Longobard guy. <laughs> Longobard. This is a fun word. <laughs> Just like Longobard. <laughs> Just not quite sure what it means. I mean, well, it's a type of, it's a, it's a, I don't know, he's a king, a king of the Longobards. Well, well, since we're so curious, Longobard people. Yeah, anything It's not even giving me, it's telling me like the Lombards, but no, he's a Longobard. Are you sure it's not Lombard and you just got it wrong? Maybe this website had it wrong. I copied and pasted it. Oh, wow. I'm glad you're putting so much effort into our notes here, Kara. Well, I, then I curate them a little bit. <laughs> the, the Longobard King Rotari. Here, I'll put it in there. Maybe he is a Lombard. This is going to be embarrassing. Is it he's, gonna he's, be a, he, he's a Lombard. Like... <laughs> he's, he's a Lombard. He's yeah. a Lombard? <laughs> yeah. Not a, not a Longobard. <laughs> oh, go. fuck. I love us. Yeah. King of the Lombard. So Rotari or Rothair was of the House of Aridus, King of the Lombards, not Longobards. From 636 to 652. Okay, so here, you're not completely wrong. Here's a thing that says the Longobards, a.k.a. the Lombards, or translates to Longbeards. Oh, that makes sense. This is Italy, so that's what Longobardi. Yes. Longobard. All right, so that's so probably, they were, lo, lo, Lombard is probably French. They were a polyethnic confederation of barbarians. So you are not wrong with Longobard. Okay, there we go. That makes me feel better. Thank God. Like, wow, we really need to. Wow, God, we gotta double notes. check some of these yeah. notes. Yeah, when we're like just copy and pasting from Wikipedia. No, I'm kidding. Hire, hire fact checkers. Yeah. I never do Wikipedia, but sometimes I think the it's sources I joke, find Kara. might be less. I know, but I'm saying that sometimes, like, I'm like, we can't do Wikipedia, but sometimes I'm like, there are like people who go in and like edit Wikipedia and fact check it. Yeah. Maybe not the case for some of the sites I find. Although I do try to <laughs> check across multiple sites. We do our best. We really, we try. And that's all we that try. you can ask from us. The point so. is, no one's going to like tell you your wrongs if you're like the boozy biddies said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, first of all, who the fuck are the boozy biddies? And second of all, that seems like a very credible news source <laughs> when it comes to right. alcohol and alcohol only. <laughs> and hey. apparently very liberal minded PSAs. <laughs> so. yep. It's 90% what, how you say it, 10% what you say. So yeah, as long as you say it, confidence. As, as long as you say it authoritatively, anyone will believe you. <laughs> Why do you think I've been in sales for so long? I think I lie <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> there we go. All um, right. Now that we know the Longobards are the Lombards, and I didn't and make an the egregious long mistake. And yep. they're the Longbeards. Yeah. Well, just from now, I mean, that's probably like if I was back in that time period, that would probably be like the guy, my type of guy, because like you know I love the facial hair. So I'd probably be like interested in the Longbeards, Longobards. <laughs> I'd be like swiping on like Etruscan Tinder and being like, oh, look, a Longobard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so uh, there are some grapes that are grown in this part of Italy. <laughs> yes, there are. Uh, yes. And they're all so, like I, almost confusingly grown. No, the sea, all these red ones. Yeah. So they, um, so there's like three big styles that I've kind of ascertained are the big styles known with um, Veneto. Veneto? Veneto. Veneto. <laughs> Veneto. Um, there's the Valpolicellas. There's the Suaves for white and the Proseccos for sparkling. And then the Amarones. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about how those fall into a few different styles later. But the big red ones that we're going to see are going to be Corvina, Corvinone, and Rondanella. And so... Corvina is considered to be like the highest quality of the three grapes. Corvinone was thought to be a descendant of Corvina, but it's actually just kind of closely related. So probably like an uncle grape to Corvina <laughs> instead of, you know, being the son <laughs> or daughter of it. I don't know. I don't know how it identifies. And then, um, yeah, apparently Rondanella, my textbook, didn't have enough t- 
care to say it about it, but those are usually used in the Valpolicellos that we see. And then the whites are going to be Garganega and Garganega and Glera. So Glera is going to be known for Prosecco. Um, I think Garganega mostly for the Suaves is what I'm understanding, correct? Mm-hmm. And they yes. do have international varietals, not like, you know, we talked about uh, Piemonte last week. They barely had any. They will do Merlot, both the cabs, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Blanc, um, Chardonnay. They've got, you know, a little bit more on the international variety front. But um, they are, per- they slightly produce more white wine than red wine. And I think a lot of that is because of their s- Prosecco um, influence. Because you're drinking a Prosecco, correct? Yeah. Yes, my Prosecco is from Veneto. And that's, yeah, so Prosecco can be from Veneto. Fren- Veneto and I think Friuli. I think I, I have s- no idea because we haven't gotten to that region yet. I know in 2010 they tightened the restrictions on the use of the term Prosecco because the Glera grape used to be called the Prosecco grape. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's known as Glera and the term Prosecco is referred to the region where it's produced and the designated area. Any sparkling wine from that designated area can use the term Prosecco. So it's kind of gone down the Champagne route or the Cava route where it has to be from that one region. So I don't or that area that's designated. So I don't know if Friuli does it or not or if that got changed. Um, but I think. Um, Veneto is the more commonly known Prosecco one. Right. Um, yeah. And, and a DOCG Prosecco has to be from Corneliano Valdo, Valdo Valdobiane. Yeah. Valdobiadene. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. So they have to be 85% Glera and then the remainder can contain any assortment of white grapes. You know, they listed off something for Diso, Pereira, Bianchetta, Pinot Grigio. I mean, there's a few other ones. Um, but uh, they also recently, I was looking at Veneto in the news, always trying to see if we can find something that's like a little bit more tied in with the current times that we're, you know, recording this episode. And I guess now you're allowed to make rosé prosecco under the DOC. It was not, you could always make rosé prosecco, but you couldn't mm-hmm. call it prosecco until uh, last year, essentially. So if it's a rosé prosecco, which is going to start growing in the market, so we might start seeing more of those because I've actually never had a rosé prosecco. I don't know if you have. I mean, I have. I don't know. It has to be 85% Glera and then 15% Pinot Noir. Okay. I think I yeah. have. I think at a restaurant. Um, so what is yeah. the Prosecco that you're drinking right now? Yeah. So I am drinking Covale, Covale C-O-V-A-L-L-I, Prosecco Brut. Um, Prosecco does have four levels, I believe. I actually have it here. Um, from driest to sweet, they have brut, extra dry, dry, and demi sec, which is pretty standard. Um, that brut is the driest, mm-hmm. drier than extra dry, which is can be confusing. Yeah, um, that's where it gets I, confusing with that sweetness scale. Yeah, and that's the thing. And I tend to, if I'm buying prosecco, I tend to go for brut. I find prosecco to be naturally sweeter than like a champagne it method is. produced bubbly. <clears throat> so I tend to. You're going to find brute and extra dry to be pretty common. Um, and I tend to just go for the, the brute. Um, so that's that little extra bit drier. The one thing I didn't actually research, which probably would have been a smart thing for me to do, how is Prosecco produced? Is it the traditional method? Traditional method being, no, the champagne like method. Like the champagne no. method? is no. produced using the Charmat method. It's a large body of wine goes through second fermentation in tanks rather than in the individual bottle, and then bottled under pressure. So I feel like this is almost like the Coca-Cola method. Forced carbonation? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, and actually, there is a Prosecco Colfondo, which, I, which I've never seen, but apparently it's more of the, the Pet Nat style. Natural leaning and minimal intervention wines. Um, that sounds like it'd be interesting. Yeah, it actually does. I mean, you know me and you and Bubbles, we get along famously well. Yeah. I mean, we have a great time. I don't know if we feel great the next morning, but right. sometimes we reach out to our Italian professor asking us if him be on our podcast and he politely declines, but you know, it happens. Right. It's, yeah. I mean, it would be helpful because, you know, we do speak the Italian better than the other languages, but... Some of this pronunciation is still escaping us. But yeah, but so mine, it was really affordable. I think this was like $12. And a lot of times you can't, like Prosecco is affordable. Um, It's rare you're really spending like $35 plus on a bottle of this kind of bubbly as opposed to others. Um, But yeah, so mine, primary grape, of course, Glera. Um, It's a non-vintage. I don't know what else. I couldn't find too much on the the producer. I really just went for it because it was one of the only ones that was available at the moment. (laughs) Well, it's specified brute. There actually are a few Proseccos, but mm. um, 
they didn't the other ones didn't specify what they what they were and that's the one thing i have learned since i do lean towards more kava um and like traditional method produced bubbles these days when i do drink a prosecco i need it to be on the drier side yeah i like this one that's the way i drink too yeah but you're drinking i'm not dry but my my sparkling wine is dry (laughs) 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 what are you drinking though (laughs) <laughs> I'm drinking. I thought I was going to be like so cool because I'm looking at all these appellations and a lot of the um, there's like 14 DOCGs and Amarone della Valpolicella is the most distinguished. We'll talk about Amarone and how that style is made in a second after I get through my white wine because it is a red. So I want to start with the whites. Um, uh, but another one. Uh, but I was like looking how there's actually a lot of DOCs that uh, make more traditional wines. Um, so I guess more like of the, um, native grapes, not necessarily international varietals, smaller production, or just even like may- maybe more table wine kind of thing. Not like mm-hmm. it's not classified as table wine, but the idea that it's like not as expressive because this is a wicked light dry white wine that I'm drinking right, right now. But so I was reading through this and I saw that one of the regions that did this was Lugana. And it actually like brought my eye in because I used to live in Lugano in Switzerland. And so I was like, oh, Lugano, Lugano. I know it's different, but like, I don't right. know. It was just a, a memory connection for me. So I went to my little store on the corner uh, called the Wine Dispensary. And um, I was looking actually to start. I wanted a Suave. Um, and they didn't have that, but they had this one. I saw Lugana on the label and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember reading that from my notes. I'll get this Lugana. Come to find out as I do more research that Lugana straddles the Veneto and Lombardi. Um, oh, uh, is that where the regions? Longobards were in love? Yeah. So obviously I've got a type. It's the long bearded wines as well. <laughs> Um, but it straddles uh, Veneto and Lombardi. So, but I found out that ninety percent of the DOC is in Lombardi. So I'm most likely drinking a Lombardi wine today. Um, but at least it's the idea behind it. It's the same type of wine that's made in the Lugana side in Veneto. It's made from the Trebbiano de Lugana grape, which is also called Turbiano, and it was recently found out to be closely related to the Verdicchio grape. Um, but I'm drinking it from a winery called Ca di Frati, and um, from what I read, it's aged for six months on the lees in stainless steel. So as much as it's dry, there is a little bit more weight to it. You know, but, yeah. you know I always like to say that that yeast sludge mimics like oak aging without giving you the oaky profile, just adds more weight. Um, but really dry and drinkable because I'm back in Denver after the East Coast, um, you know, trip. And it is 100 degrees out today here <laughs> on September 9th. So it's just... That. Yeah, it's just still, it's supposed to be like 100 degrees for the next few days until I disappear in a glacier, um, but it is just hot, and so I really didn't want to drink a Valpolicella, and I certainly wasn't going to pony up for an Amarone today, so. Right. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's really cool. Um, might be from Lombardy, might be from Veneto, whatever. We're That's cool. kind of neat that there is a, a region that, it's interesting that there it. is a wine region, yeah, that straddles the two, mm-hmm. I guess, are they states, regions? I don't know. I guess, I don't know if they're like brought, are they designated by like like actual states like provinces or states or is it just like regions where they're like this is, is this Tuscany area being, a state cause... i think it's a region here we go um it's their regions yeah so they have just so they can go over like yeah so yeah okay, so they they're regions and they contain provinces and it seems like your province spans two regions okay gotcha so, yeah. so i'm at least in the right province <laughs> <laughs> oh, um God. But it was really good. I mean, white, like we said, white wines are uh, made just a tiny bit more than red wines out there. But one of the big styles is the apasimiento style, which is um, wines made from both white and red wines made from dried grapes. And there's a couple different, you know, ways to do this. But I thought it was kind of interesting because it is unique to this area, especially with the Amarone. But this essentially, usually when you see the apasimiento styles, and they usually say like repasso on the label, is that? Right. Yes, I believe. Yep. Yeah. So there's a couple different ways. There's a couple different styles. So Rapasso does fall into this a little bit. Um, but essentially, you start by taking like ripe bunches of grapes and you handpick them at harvest. And instead of going to the press, you pretty much just leave them to dry. And you can dry them, you know, in slatted boxes on open shelves or some people will hang them from the ceiling with hooks but they're left to dry until like mid-january so if you think about harvest in italy we're probably thinking like september-ish is when they're harvesting um 
you know, could be a little bit into August, could be a little bit in October, depending on the season. But the grapes are left to dry until mid-January or longer. Um, and that's usually when 60% of their water content has disappeared through evaporation. And then they're brought into the winery and they do a cool fermentation that extends into like March, April, or May. So it just depends mm-hmm. on how long. But another few months of fermentation that's very long and cold. <clears throat> and then most are stopped at 12%. And that leaves a ton of residual sugar, and that produces the Ricciotto sweet wine. So they can also make that a sparkling wine using that Charmant method as well by retaining the carbon dioxide in a pressure tank. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people will allow the wine to ferment completely dry. That will reach like 15 to 16% alcohol, and that's where we get Amarone de la Valpolicella. So that's where that comes from. And that's okay. why it, it's expensive because it takes, it's a process. Um, I think it has to be a minimum of 15%, but they, most will just let it go fully dry. But it is a dry red wine made from these, you know, um, apasamiento style grapes. But then there is the one thing that you brought up, this repasso. And that's essentially where they take the sediment or the leaves from an Amarone or Recioto, and it, they add it to a young wine, which creates a very short second fermentation. But they don't capture the CO2, so it's not going to be sparkling, but it becomes mm-hmm. a Reposo wine, and it just adds flavor, tannin, and alcohol. So it's more it's like You think it's like highly concentrated at that point. You know, all the water is dispersed out of the grape or evaporated out of the grape, so now you've got this like really concentrated thing going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, li- I like those ones. Those are good. I, I, did we ever drink an Amarone together? Was that the one that we had the issue with at the restaurant in Northampton? Or was that a Barolo? I, I have no, I couldn't, no, I thought it was a Barolo. I don't think we ordered something that big. I don't know. I feel like we did an Amarone. Usually the only time I drink Amarone is with my dad because he's the one buying it. <laughs> yeah. And it was a nice bottle, but I don't think it was like a Barolo level. Um, yeah. I mean, so last time we recorded besides, you know, the mini so 25 minutes ago, um, was Johnny B's birthday, and I was drinking Barolo to start the day. God, that day went downhill real quick. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had some margaritas at lunch with some tacos. We had Barolo, some rum. Barolo to margaritas? Oh, God. Oh, Kara, it gets worse. Then we had some um, rum punches on the decks at my favorite deck bar in Portsmouth called Old Fairies Landing. And then we were walking back. My mother was DD, by the way. My mother was not drinking. She was DD. My dad and I were definitely intoxicated. Um, we get back to the car and my dad's like, you know what sounds really good right now? And we're like, what? And he's like, a steak and a cab. And I was like, oh, it's like so hot out. <laughs> like, we just drank all this like, sugary liquid. And I don't know, man. But it was dad's birthday. So we went to the bar and had a bottle of cake bread at the library restaurant in downtown Portsmouth. A bottle of cake bread and some steak. And dad housed so much of this cake bread that... When I got him off the bar stool, I realized that he was going to ping pong. So I like kind of like oh, no. supported him. And then he just fell down the stairs outside the restaurant, just fell right down the stairs. And my mother is being like, Johnny, this is so embarrassing. And my dad's like laughing his ass off. And he's like, stop it, Eileen. It's my birthday. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so yeah, so that's what happens when you start drinking Barolo at noon. You keep making bad decisions for the rest of the day. Well, they sounded like they were good in and of themselves. Just the combination was oh, too much. Oh, we had a blast. Yeah. Had a blast. This also, what happens when your daughter's a podcaster. And you- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when drinking sure. during the day, I, this is normalizing drinking during the day. I would say the, you know, the paycheck justifies the problem is why I've been working in the booze industry for so long. So, yeah. yep. Well, here we are recording during the day. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, at least it's a little better on your terms because it's at least four o'clock where you're at. Yeah. But we started at three, which is still acceptable. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. But we managed to bust out two podcasts and we did not get super distracted. Right. I think we actually covered everything. So we, we actually covered lines. every bullet point. We did. Look at us. We did in the wine styles. 30, we did the history. In 30 minutes, we're, we're champions now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Is there anything? Should we talk about Suave? Did we do that already? Yeah. No, it's Garganega. There you go. Yeah, it's a Suave. Great yeah, drinking. Suave from the gar- and that's, yeah, I really like that. That's very easy to drink. I love Suave. Um, has a nice little Although bit of this, crispness um, to it. This long beard wine is uh, pretty tasty. Yeah. Well, that's, so. I would go through, like, when, I mean, the seasons aren't changing for you yet, but when it does start to get, like, transitional seasons, like September here in Connecticut, I really go for, like, white wine aged on the lees because I really find it gives it that little extra bit. Well, I would definitely recommend looking for something from Lugana because apparently everything from Lugana is usually made from Trebbiano de Lugana or the mm. Trebbiano grape. And I think Lee's aging is um, important to them. Cool. 
Well, but that's yeah. a new one I can try. So yeah. So yeah, and hopefully if any of you were unfamiliar with some of the other wines we talked about and go out and try them. I got to do more of like the um, Amarones because I do like them, but I never They're so tasty. They're just like not cheap. Right. But that's like my husband and I for like Friday or Saturday night usually. We like will occasionally go up, you know, 30 40 $50 just because it's – we don't hang out during the week. So this is our, our, our big wine night. Oh, that's so. nice. Yeah, I definitely like look into an Amarone. They're one of my favorites and I just – always ask my dad to go to Italian restaurants for our father-daughter date nights together because <laughs> so he, can buy, get the, get he the buys an Amarone. And my mother even is like, my dad and I have a tradition of like having one meal, just the two of us to like just hang out every time I'm home. And um, it's obviously changed a little bit in the pandemic just because it's been harder. But um, it's just always, mom's always like, he always buys you nicer wine than he buys me. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah. I'm a wine podcaster, mom. I appreciate um, it. I need this more than you. I have to talk about this for potentially a living. <laughs> Well, you can, well, there you go. You can always write it off now that we have our LLC. So. I know. Mm-hmm. I well, know. I think we, we survived this. I'm going to, if I don't die in Glacier next week on all of my hikes and my rafting, then we'll return with, what are we doing next? Uh, we have another mini so we got to come up with a topic. Oh, yeah, the mini so And then what's our next region going to be? Are we going to do Tuscany? Are we going right there? Or are we going somewhere else? We'll have to strategize. We'll have well, done Maybe Lombardi. Italy. This is our fourth Italy it's... episode, so maybe we need to do... You know, one more and then Tuscany and on Tuscany. Okay. All right. I mean, All we right, can well, always come back to Italy. We like, can always sure. do that. Yeah. Well, I hope everyone goes and double fist themselves today. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want the details, though. That's right. All right. Well, <laughs> cheers, <laughs> Unless it comes everyone. Cheers. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>